It's going down, and you're invited for what they selling. We ain't buying. There is no running. There is no hiding. There's only fighting or dying. It's going down, and you're invited for what they selling. We ain't buying. There is no running. There is no hiding. There's only fighting or dying. It's Going Down is a digital community center from anarchist, anti-fascist, autonomous, anti-capitalist, and anti-colonial movements. Our mission is to provide an autonomous and resilient platform to publicize and promote revolutionary theory and action. Go to itsgoingdown.org for daily updates, check out our online store for ways to donate, and rate and follow us on iTunes if you like this podcast. Yamodibo Kadale, the author of the book, uh, Intimate Direct Democracy, Port Mose, The Great Dismal Swamp, and the Human Quest for Freedom. And I live in, I'm, I'm a retired professor from uh, of many schools, many universities, and I live in Midway, Georgia. And, uh, uh, you know, I'm the author of the book, and I work with Andrew. Uh, I'm Andrew Zonneville. I'm a historian and naturalist and educator from uh, Atlanta, where I still live. <laughs> um, I am the co-founder of On Our Own Authority Publishing, which is an independent radical publishing house, and a co-founder of the Atlanta Radical Book Fair. And I wrote the uh, introduction um, to Modibo's book, Intimate Direct Democracy, as well as that of the his previous book, Pan-African Social Ecology, um, and Modi and I have actually been collaborating on various projects for about 10 years now. Yeah. Why write a book about the Great Dismal Swamp? Well, what we're trying to do is trying to set the record straight about when the American de- Democratic, the so-called Democratic experiment came from and why it's a big lie, really, just to break with it. And so we were trying to talk about the intimate direct democracy that was already here when the when the conquistadors and the colonialists came and they destroyed these intimate direct threads of democracy and created a, a sham democracy on top of it and we tried to show it was happening in the great dismal swamp which was really a, a place of freedom and a place of refuge and fort mose in, in florida which was a Another place that the people were running away, running away to, and trying to establish some kind of real uh, de- democratic, uh, uh, a democratic tradition that has been lost and has not been studied. So that's why we wrote the book. A little bit more background on the book was that this book actually uh, was in the works before Modipo's previous book, Pan African Social Ecology, and. Um, I was aware of uh, this book, Intimate Direct Democracy, and, and and it didn't have a title yet, but it was it, a book on comparing Fort Mose and the Great Dismal Swamp was in the works. Um, and during our conversations regard, related to that project, um, we hit on the idea of putting out uh, another book of Modibo's uh, speeches, uh, conversations, interviews, essays, um, which became uh, Pan-African Social Ecology, which was the previous book that he put out. And it worked out really nicely because uh, I think that book kind of um, reintroduced Modibo's work uh, to a new audience and um, and I think primed uh, some readers for uh, this next project, um, which uh, we're really, really proud of. Don't be a trilogy. Yeah, there's a third one coming too. There's a third one coming Oh, too. wow. And they're, the, they're the right size. They're, they're intimate size. They're, you, know, you can put it in your hand. You can put it in your hand, and you won't be overwhelmed by it. I wrote an earlier book, a big thick book. Man, nobody read that one. So we decided we, decided we better write. We better write something smaller, you know. And uh, and, and the, judging by the reception of the first book, it, it's working really. It's, it's really working. What so will be the uh, the third book? The third book, what, what, what the first book does is uh, talk about how history has been miswritten 
and, and we, we want it to be written from the bottom up. And so uh, the, the, the second book is an attempt to do that and give two examples of, of how it should work. And the third book is going to be how are we going to study empires and, and how the empires are, are looked at and what they really mean. And the third book will be an appeal to people to rewrite history from the from the bottom, from the little crevices, and look at these strains of direct democracy, these threads that we are, we hypothesize that are that's a part of the history of the human uh, human beings on this planet. And so it'll be a broader uh, uh, history, but we're gonna try to keep it just you know in, in about one 150, 160 pages. Awesome. It's actually be, being written as we speak. Yep. Mm. Great. We'll look forward to that one as well. And and some of those uh, topics we'll get into a little bit later in the interview. But just going forward, you both use this uh, term "intimate direct democracy," um, talking about you know the ecological centering of both indigenous forms of life that existed pre-colonization, as well as the maroon societies, which we'll talk about in depth as we go on. Mm-hmm. But do you want to just kind of give us off the bat some examples of what you mean by intimate direct democracy when we're talking about pre-colonization or people yeah. actively resisting it? Well, well, intimate direct democracy has to be understood in juxtaposition and opposition to representative democracy. And representative democracy is what you know the American hierarchy tells you is what democracy is. Representative, you you vote for somebody and then they go off and do what they want to do, and you don't have any control over what they do or say. Oh, uh, and they they you know they put it to you. So we're saying that we're saying that that it can't be democracy because as soon as you give up your right to speak to somebody else who's going to speak for you, you're doomed. <laughs> you're really doomed. And so intimate direct democracy. Is, is an attempt like what the native people were doing, not just in uh, in the Great Dismal Swamp and not just in, in uh, Fort Mose, but throughout the, uh, the uh, Haudenosaunee Confederation and the other places, and, and the, not only just in the North America, and also in Africa and even in Europe, people were actually uh, knowing uh, the people who they work with and they were intimately connected with these people and they decided not by representatives but decided in a face-to-face way how they were going to govern themselves and uh we're saying that that's a part of human uh existence on social existence on this planet that is not being studied what is being studied is the great heroes and the great leaders and the potentates and all that and so we want to just get away from that and, and really start studying human history so that we can understand how we can keep the planet away from these people who are trying to destroy it you know one of the real strengths of modibo's work is that like many of us who maybe are avid readers of history or or who are activists might already be familiar with the uh the kind of genre of people's history and history from below. But even within that genre, for lack of a better word, there can be a tendency to focus on charismatic individuals and um, and kind of frame people's history in a very similar way that, that uh, historians have always written history. I shouldn't say always, but have, have dominantly been writing history. Um, sometimes people's history can look very much like that dominant vision, um, just kind of flipped around. Um, but the strength of Modibo's work, which is really something that I've tried to learn from, and I think a lot of people can learn from, is is he goes to pains to <laughs> to uh, ignore the ignore, <laughs> ignore individuals almost entirely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, not really, but. But, but to, to the extent that he can tell the story as a, as a social story, as a, as a collective human story, um, uh, he makes damn sure that he does it that way. And, um, and I think that that's on, on full display uh, in this book. And uh, it really is, the book really does present uh, a challenge to uh, everyone, 
of course, especially historians, but but to everybody, because everybody, anybody can be a historian. Mm-hmm. Um, it presents a challenge to reassess how you look at history. And he, and Omoribo offers this lens of intimate direct democracy, which is uh, the, essentially, like you said, the people self-governing in a face-to-face way. And the, the, the intimacy aspect, um, as I understand it, comes from every, people knowing each other and having that social intimacy uh, and knowing one another's uh, uh, backgrounds, beliefs, agendas, and, and stuff like that. And um, and uh, that is a is a prerequisite for uh, real, you know, directly democratic life. Yeah, yeah, and it's and it's, and it's work. It's a part of uh, human history. We just have to tease it out and tease it out. And so, mm-hmm. what we're doing with this trilogy is is begging for it, appealing to you know to people to try to do it, give examples of it being done, and show how the whole vision of human social justice on the planet can be looked at that way. And uh, I mean, and, and then we want to put these books in places where people can get them, not not in little places like in the library in the corner in the dark of, of a big university somewhere, but where people who are, you know, they go to the bookstores in these little places and these little state parks and, and they can pick it up and they can read it. It's, it's manageable and, 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 and you know, and, 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 it, and it's readable, hopefully. How did you find it? How did you find it readable? Yeah. Yeah, okay, okay. I just want to make sure we're doing the right thing. Well, let me let me just ask you both, you know, as an aside, what's it like to put out this people's history at a time when the state is actively promoting things like attacking quote unquote critical race oh, theory? Yeah. Oh yeah, oh yeah. This is the time for it. We, we I, I I think we're right on time, really. I agree. Yeah. And, and I think we 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 can develop this, and I think people are hungry for it. And once they get the idea about it, that will inform their activism. You know, they will not think that they're doing something really, really new, but they're in in in, in harmony not only with the natural world, but with, with with human social striving on the planet. You know, human beings haven't always been shooting at one another in these big, massive nation states, uh, colliding on borders and all that kind of stuff, and and these these uh. Politicians lying to everybody. Everybody know they lying. I mean, the right, the left, the center. Everybody know these lying. You know? <laughs> and then they don't run to help anybody. They run because they can uh, create out some kind of fiefdom, some kind of uh, inter- inter- space between them as a representative and a patronage group that they can uh, get derive. Uh, the money from and then you know it's just just a big mess and then people can see it people see it and they don't quite know what to make of it but uh i'm trying to explain that i see it too and if you see it and i see it then we are not alone (laughs) and there's and there's a history to this you know like i i think that when we're talking about the uh general disaster that is uh you know, so-called representative democracy. Bojimo's uh, research here helps us to understand where this came from and it helps us to understand that in the case of the United States and arguably any settler colonialist state, uh, real democracy was attacked, was destroyed in order to create this so-called democracy that exists now. What's another thing that's interesting about this work, and I think it also relates to its connection to uh, activism that Modibo mentioned earlier, was, is that um, the Great Dismal Swamp and Fort Mose, if you read the book, you'll instantly notice that these are two very different places, and yet they're tied together for, with this thread of intimate direct democracy. The Great Dismal Swamp was a place where people were um, certainly creating communities, but also hiding, kind of uh, uh, trying to uh, be clandestine about this thing so they can stay away from, uh, you know, English settler colonial authorities um, and, you know, establish some kind of uh, freedom for themselves. Um, so, too, was the Fort Mose uh, uh, settlement, but that was actually um, 
that was kind of right in your face because they crossed over to uh, Spanish colonial territory and were able to, you know, through some some cunning and some expertise, were able to maneuver the Spanish legal system in such a way that they could establish a free town for themselves. Um, and were right there on the front lines of yeah, the yeah. Spanish uh, uh, colonial conflict with the English. And, and, and we're, they were on, on all the maps. Yeah, yeah. But we, we don't want people to think, uh, as we talk about, as we don't want people to think that, and it's explained in the book, that the Spanish was doing, doing the, uh, the settlers of Port Mosaic right. some kind of favor. Right, uh, exactly. The Spanish were forced into doing that. Mm -hmm. And uh, they saw the advantage in doing that. And of yep. course, there was two iterations of Fort Mose. The first one was, I think, more 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 authentic, and the second one was really, it really couldn't, it didn't stay too long. So, you know, it, it, the story is a is a hell of a story. And I do mention one guy. I'm, I, I think I mentioned George Washington one time, don't I? Yeah, one yeah, time. Something, but something I mentioned <laughs> uh, uh, Francisco Menendez. Mm -hmm. Uh, but he he was a he was a Mandinka, and he came over to South Carolina. Well, he was brought over to South Carolina, and you know, as an enslaved person. And then he ran away and joined the Yamasee. You know, in the, in the Yamasee War, fought and started a militia with some other enslaved Maroons, and uh, they fought and fought and fought. And then they were they were eventually uh, defeated for the time being. They went down south, and they were the one of <clears throat> one of the original threads of the Fort Mose piece. And he was a um, very influential citizen of Fort Mose. He could read, he could write, he could thank you. His life was uh, a part of a of a development that you know his story is his story, but it's it's not. I, I mentioned him in order to. Give people to understand that this time was very dynamic, and his life was so very. Uh, you know, he he existed as many different things in his life. Right. Yeah. Yeah, he's one of those people that you can look at and you can learn a lot about the period. Yeah, you can from looking at at, at his life, not as a not as a, like an exceptional uh, person who stands above everybody else, but as a a, a person of his time. Yeah, and, and 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 they the people helped the, the people. He had some skills that the people could use. Mm -hmm. and he put them at the disposal of, of the people, and, and uh, you know he he was uh, he, he was he was like a a, 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 a villager. You know, the, the, these people were familiar with that style of decision making because it was a part of them. It was a part of them in Africa. It was a part of them as the, as the Creeks. It was a part of them as a you know, as, as their different uh, clan groups and their different groups as they evolved in, in, in opposition and resistance to the colonial aggression. Well, in the first part of the book, um, it's written about the Great Dismal Swamp. Uh, it says, yeah. these joint stock companies provided a mechanism for the accumulation of rock capital in the form yeah. of massive network as, of enslaved labor farms called plantations well beyond the political reach of the European aristocracy, a process that eventually led to this socially and ecologically disastrous industrial revolution. And I think yeah. this is a really important point, and I know obviously this has been written about by lots of people, but can you talk more about the connection between uh, racialized slavery and the plantation system that gave rise to what we would call today global capitalism in the industrial revolution? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, um, the, 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 that particular explanation um, was formed in my mind as I began to understand where did capitalism come from? Why did it? Why did it? What, what, what was about Europe that made capitalism begin there? Why didn't it begin in China? Why didn't it begin in India? Why? Why didn't it begin somewhere else? And then I, I realized that capitalism didn't even begin in Europe. What, what, capitalism was a Three pro it began on all three continents simultaneously, mm -hmm. like the plantations of the New World through their various iterations. The Spanish wanted the gold and all that, but the plantation, the agricultural plantations of the New World, was the a formation of capital. It's a capitalist formation. 
the the uh, factories of uh, Manchester and, and Liverpool, they were capitalist formation. The the, the slave ports in um, off the Guinea off the Guinea coast, uh, they were capitalist. They were they were <clears throat> collecting labor, mm-hmm. and um, they tried different experiments. And as a matter of fact, Charlestown was almost a failure at first. And so what they did is uh, develop these stock companies. And these joint stock companies allowed British merchants to accumulate capital outside of the reach of the um, of the aristocracy. The aristocracy couldn't squash them because they had ways of, of of managing it outside of their reach. And of course, at first they were they were deceiving them. But anyway, then they took the surpluses back to Europe. But by the time they got back to Europe. They were they were con- the merchants. The ascendant merchant class was controlling all of that stuff, and so that merchant class became strong enough to topple that aristocracy in Europe. It couldn't it couldn't do that in, in China because the aristocracy was right there with the boot on top of the merchant classes, and so it was the enslaved this enslaved plantation. These uh, these uh, these uh, enslavement farms allowed capital to be accumulated and the surpluses to be transported to Europe. Of course, the the uh, uh, the navigable technology, the shipping, and all that kind of stuff allowed it to be uh, shipped between the three continents. And that's why capitalism appeared to begin in Europe. European European society was the benefactor of it all, and that's why. And of course, uh, the enslavement plantation was not. Uh, regarded <laughs> as a capitalist institution. If you look at the old communist writings in the United States, they they, they would say that it was uh, it was a feudal <laughs> feudal kind of system. Yeah, that's a hell of an oversight. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what they. And so I wrote my dissertation on why capitalism, why the enslaved plantation was really a capitalist institution. Now it wasn't racialized at first. At first was, you know, the indentured, like the 1619 project. Those people who came over in 1619 were not enslaved people. Uh, maybe you need to correct our, our, you know, our people on that. Uh, they were, they were, uh, they were indentured servants. And the legalistic language that did not uh, take place in Virginia until after, uh about 60 or 70 years, and they started writing these runaway slave code. And they wrote that so that the labor plantation would be permanent, so they can continue to control that labor. And, and of course, they had to take the land away from the native people. So with the labor, which was a factor of the means of production in America, and the land united in the plantation, the joint stock companies became profitable in shifting the surpluses back to New England and England. And that's how the, um, the system emerged. But it was definitely rooted in Virginia. And uh, the Dismal Swamp <clears throat> uh, stopped it from going south because it was rooted in Virginia and tobacco. And the tobacco plantations went north and up and down the Chesapeake. That's why you have them small states up there like Delaware and, uh, and Maryland. In the Eastern Shore, all of those were slave states, enslavement states. But, you know, it's a remarkable story. Uh, and, of course, with the, the runaway slave codes and the development of the patty rollers and the policemen, then you have what you have today. But it's, that's where it started. I think, too, we should probably give some credit to C.L.R. James and Eric Williams and Walter yeah, Rodney yeah, and his, yeah, who yeah, all made yeah. uh, also made contributions in uh, mm-hmm. in this field of study. Uh, so too did uh, Marcus Redeker with his book on the slave ship, which yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. is a uh, is a basically his argument was that the, the slave ship was a uh, itself a kind of capitalist factory. And you know, you know, it's really strange though. Um, how how these two prongs? This, that's why we that's why we named the book Pan African Social Ecology because it seems like there were two different strands of the same progressive tendency, but because of racism they would not meet. You know, 
like like Butchkin was not uh, a Pan Africanist, mm-hmm. and uh, T.L.R. James was not an ecologist. Mm-hmm. You see, and uh, yeah. it was too too the war was a little bit too early, but you know. The, the racism and Jim Crow has, has 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 colored our lens in looking at these various periods. Like for instance, I grew up in the segregated South, mm-hmm. so I thought white people were over here and we were over there. But earlier on, the the black people and the white people, the native people, and everybody resisted American uh, American capitalism. Everybody, you know. And that's where the Seminoles came from. Mm-hmm. That's where the Lumbee Indians in North Carolina came from. That's where the uh, and, and I just I, I don't know how that uh, how that played like that. You know, it seemed like to me a historian would have would have seen that that's what was happening. These people, the piney wood crackers in the in the Florida swamps and stuff, they were running away too. Mm-hmm. And they were mixing. That's why that's why black people are so. Uniquely, uniquely, you, you really couldn't tell after a couple of generations who was white, who was black, who was Seminole, and who was what. You know. Mm-hmm. Well, that kind of brings us to our next question. In part one of the book, it presents the era of European colonizations as a quote disastrous clash of ecological perspectives between yeah. European settlers and indigenous forms of life based around communal ownership. Uh, sustainability and horizontal social arrangements. Can you discuss more about this clash? Well, it, it, the clash was clear, in as much as even the even the uh, the European settlers were running away from capitalism and authority and, and, and really a few laws and religious persecution. But when they came to America, they had no idea of how to exist in a in a in a in a situation like like uh, the area around uh, what became Hampton Roads, you know, Jamestown was hostile to them. They were trying to you know figure it out. Matter of fact, they were, and we make the point in the book that the first uh, summer, first winter during the storming time, I mean, the starving times, they were eating their animals and they were eating their. Uh, you know, their own people in, in, in terms of cannibalism, which uh, is not not a glorious history, but it's real. And then the native, they were pillaging the native people's uh, stores of food. And uh, if they would just say, "Look, we," it's like what some of the people did. We are a common group of people, and we have to exist here. And the people who've been existing here probably had more to say than 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 the people who were coming there, and uh, it was a clash. It was a real clash, and that led to the capitalists won. And then what they did is all of human knowledge and technology was developed in such a way, including the financial resources, that took people away from the natural world. Mm-hmm. The natural world became a resource. Mm. It became capital. It became owned, owned by one group and became dis- not owned by another group. And that's what we see today with the uh, nuclear, these nation states clashing and uh, people killing one another. I mean, I, I didn't go to the war in Vietnam. I'm a, I would have been a Vietnam veteran, but you can't glorify that. I mean, we go around the world killing people, mm-hmm. and they're, they're, they're <laughs> but nation states and their loyalty they took people, loyalty to nations that allowed that to be legal and moral and uh, really defensible. So when, to me, that's a big detour. Mm-hmm. If human beings did not conceptualize the natural world as capital and private property, then uh, we should probably have a better chance of saving ourselves. But now you go up and down the same coast. You see the uh, the paper mills polluting all the rivers. Mm-hmm. Yep. You see the natural environment all different. You know, it, it's really pathetic. You know what I mean? And everybody sees it. Yep. And capitalism did that. Not human beings, but capitalism did that. I think that, like, also with respect to the 
clashing perspectives um, that were at play during the uh, colonial invasion. Um, the, uh, the Great Dismal Swamp is a really perfect example for that, because as Modibo points out in the book, um, even if you look at the name, the Great Dismal Swamp, you you see that what you see how you, the European colonizers how they saw nature around them the swamp which was something that was full of life you know teeming with with abundance this uh, but because it 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 could not give way to uh, uh, a profit making farm system. Um, that this this swamp, which is so full of natural abundance, was dismal, right? And it was it was this vast and scary thing. Um, but for the people who escaped to it, who escaped from slavery in the English colonies and and uh, and fled to the swamp, uh, this site of natural abundance was also a, a, a safe haven and, a, and an opportunity to uh, reconstitute a directly democratic way of life that had been stripped from them. Yeah. If you go out there now, you see it's a little fragment of itself. It just didn't happen here, though. It just didn't happen in the Great Desmond Swamp. It happened in the Chalaya out there in Louisiana. It happened in the uh, Obongo in Namibia. It happened in the Great Equatorial Belt of Africa. It happened in, uh, it's all, in Europe. It's not nothing like it was. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? You uh, know, it. it it uh, it's really a, and then, then somehow somehow in our mind and our thinking, this is regarded as the human progress. Mm. They done taught the blazers, they done messed up messed up every damn thing, you know. And uh, I don't know whether you remember just a while, a while ago with the pandemic when the plane stopped flying. Mm-hmm. And uh, there was less traffic on the roads, and some factories uh, uh, settled, uh, settled down. Some friends of mine wrote me from Italy, and they said the, the dolphins had returned to the great uh, to the, the, uh, the, the uh, Grand Canal in Venice, <laughs> and the air was clear just for a moment. And there are Chinese people today who never even saw the sky as being blue, but they did then. That just goes to show you, and of course now they started it back up, and here we go again. You know? But uh, it's it's, a, it's a, a disastrous thing that's been happening, and really I'm very sensitive to it. Let me tell you why I'm so sensitive to it, because I grew up out here <clears throat> with a, there's a paper mill out here, and, and mm-hmm. it's a sawdust, and I had asthma, and I could not breathe. <laughs> you know what I mean? And my poor mother. Uh, you know, she was she, she she really loved me, but she would be trying to make sure that I woke up in the morning. Mm-hmm. And I, it really was. I mean, I was a sick child, and so it was indelibly imprinted on my mind that this air is not breathable. But I mm-hmm. thought it was me, but it was the air. And when when you have a good day and you can see the sun and then you can see the uh, skies, that's a wonderful thing. You know, we talked about the history and the connection between the rise of capitalism as a global system and slavery and also this kind of clash of of ecological perspectives. We've been bringing it up, but let's now actually talk about the Great Dismal Swamp and the rise of these maroon societies. Just kind of flesh out for us, like, the size and the scale of of these societies and, you know, people living in the Great Dismal Swamp and just why... It has this historic role. The greatest most swamp that exists today is a very small fragment of what it used to be. I mean, if you go up there and look around, I mean, there's a lot of you can see how over there and uh, uh, closer to the uh, to the outer banks that was part of the Great Dismal Swamp too. The Great Dismal Swamp was really an area where where enslaved people. Uh, uh, and, and, and white people and indentured servants and native people. They, it was all over the place. They had settlements. Now, it's hard to give you a particular number, but I can say there were thousands of, 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 of people in hundreds of the communities. And they were flat societies. 
No, they weren't. Uh, you know, they wouldn't be if if if, if you were a uh, a person living in an urban setting, and you went out there and you saw the people, they would not look like uh, the kind of people that you are familiar with. But their their diet is healthy. They're strong. They they you know they take care of themselves. And uh, it was a it was a massive scale, and and, and the, the the Lumbee now the Lumbee Indians in Lumberton, North Carolina, they are fragments of those maroon people. You ever been to Lumbee, uh, Lumberton, North Carolina, in uh, Robeson County? That native population there, and and the funny thing about it is, when when Jim Crow came to that area, they didn't know who was black and who was white, and and, and some of the Lumbees passed for white and some of them were looked at as black and it was just it's just a confusion because the policies of that time did not correspond to the reality of that time but they just mm. made it made it so you know and there's all kind of and i document all of the different little communities in the area that are still there and uh it, it's uh if you go through there and the people who know the history the older people they can tell you uh, where their people came from the dismal swamp and who they were and what they did. And uh, they look at the destruction of the swamp with the, uh, with, 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 uh, with, you know, the, the wood, the, the wood manufacturing, the logging and everything with George Washington was too, by the way. Mm-hmm. And uh, they, they destroyed that swamp, but the swamp, it maintains itself. And so there are people who are naturalists. They just say, "Well, we're going to keep some, and uh, we're going to uh, try to get, let, let people understand that there, there used to be a swamp, a big swamp here." And so the people, the society has developed and and, and moved on. But uh, the, the the legacy of the Great Dismal Swamp is a part of Eastern North Carolina, among the black people, among the white people, among the native people. It's, it's still there. I think, I mean, I think Modibo uh, said it well. Um, the the Great Dismal Swamp is, uh, is, is becoming a more and more well-known uh, site of uh, historical uh, marinage of uh, Africans in North America. And it's a, it's a huge part of the story of the southeastern region of what's now the United States, unfortunately. Um, and what I thought was really unique about Modibo's telling of this story is that like some of the other uh, histories of the Great Dismal Swamp um, bring the story a little bit further um, in, into history than Modibo's version. Modibo sets up the Great Dismal Swamp um, tells you about it and its significance. And through the uh, uh, Yamasee War, then shifts our perspective down to uh, Florida and Fort Mose. Um, and f- through looking at the Yamasee Wars, um, we're able to like see these two sites of marinages connected, not just in uh, in their similarity that there were maroons in both places and that they were, you know, governing themselves uh, democratically, but that they actually are part of the same uh, story. The same um, general struggle, yeah. Yeah, the same general struggle. Yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely, absolutely. Um, and so that's, I think, a real, a real strength of the book. Go up to central New York. <clears throat> And uh, see the Mohawk, the Anandaga, and the Cayuga, all of those people. They some of them came out of the Dismal Swamp too, and they moved up. And not so much the, 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 the Tuscarora part came out of the Great Dismal Swamp, and they went north as a result of the uh, of the last the Tuscarora War. Yeah, I mean, I, I think like the the breadth of your of of your discussion of indigenous history in this book is like really. I think uh, uh, exceptional. How big of a thorn in the side of of slavery was the Great Dismal Swamp? I think you mentioned earlier in the interview you were saying that, like you know, uh, slavery wasn't able to 
to kind of grow past the Great Dismal Swamp? I mean, can you get a little more into that? The, the, the tobacco part of it. The tobacco part. Now, below that, you had a counter. The rice began to develop and mm-hmm. running it around Charleston. <clears throat> and that's where you have the Yamasee. The Yamasee are a little, little bit further south and the Tuscarora are a little, little bit further north. Uh, but, but uh, you know, you have to read the book and get, get the perspective on it. But when you, when you look at it uh, from an ecological point of view, the, the enslaved people, which, came, which they brought over from Africa to do the rice, they began to run away too to the uh, uh, the Yamasee. And the Yamasee, there were the Yamasee wars that almost drove all of the colonists out of South Carolina. I mean, there was some serious conflict there. And the Yamasee was federated with the Maroons and everybody was together with this alliance of people and, and they was fighting tooth and nail and they almost did it. They almost ran the uh, the colonists, the enslaved colonists. Uh, they, they really encircled uh, Charleston. And Charleston was a refuge for all of those people for a while. And uh, and then, of course, the Confederate, Confederate Confederacy broke up. The Federation broke up, and they decided, they, many of them went south. Some of them went in different directions. But uh, it was uh, a time when the, what you call, well, I guess what you might call today, white radicals and uh, black uh, people and indigenous people, they were together and they were, they were, they were fighting the colonists uh, tooth and nail. And but see that, that history, the, the, the history that we read is that once upon a time there was these enlightened white people that came from Europe to civilize the native people. And, uh, but then you look around where well, you say, well, what happened to the native people? <laughs> well, they found a nice place for them out in Oklahoma. And that's where you see them now, <laughs> you know. But uh, there was contestation. I mean, violent contestation. And the Africans and the white people were all a part of it. They, they were Lumbies. They are Lumbie people right now in, 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 in Lumberton, North Carolina, with blue eyes. And, and, and by the way, let me tell you this just as a, it's not an aside, but you, you have to listen to what people, when people are talking. Like I was driving a taxi cab in Atlanta for a long time, and uh, there's a guy got in my cab, and he was from uh, Lumberton, North Carolina. He looked like a light-skinned Negro to me, you know. And so I said, "Oh, you must be a Lumby." Now he took umbrage to that. He says, "No, no, I'm not a Lumby. I am a Tuscarora, a legitimate, real." Deal Tuscarora. <laughs> so I couldn't understand why he was saying all this, you know what I mean? He was an older, older guy, a guy. But the Lumbee is a, is a name that the federal government used to put on these people, but they were the remnants of the Tuscarora that stayed there. And he identified himself as a Tuscarora native. And, uh, and, you know, he, he's probably accurate. Now that I recall the conversation. That's fascinating. Actually, as a, just a quick aside on uh, our podcast, we've been able to interview some folks from Lumberton. Uh, there were some oh, yeah. mutual aid disaster relief efforts that took place um, mm-hmm. after Hurricane Florence happened. And mm-hmm. people from the area as well as along with uh, – anarchists that came from the region to help support they were able to set up a mutual aid hub and do a lot of work there uh before or in the face of you know government inaction or the red cross basically overlooking that area well, that's, that's good to, that's good that's to great know that. yeah and you see down in down in louisiana with the uh with the uh instability of the hurricane season and stuff in, in houston and, and of course with the with the uh petrochemical corridor from Baton Rouge to Houston, you know, that that's going to be an area of great contention over the next uh, 10, 10, 12 years. Because uh, well, it's already been. I mean, you had the various hurricanes, they come every year. And they seem to get more frequent and they seem to come more often. Well, I wanted to ask about the relationship, and you've been talking about it already, but the direct relationship between the African Maroons and um, the indigenous people, you know, in particular, you talk about the Seminoles, you brought up other folks yeah, as well. Yeah. 
So talk about that coming together of those two groups of people, as you said in the book, uh, to resist or evade the violence of European colonization. In, in, in northern Florida, which was the perimeter of the, well, it's the, the con- well, Georgia, the coast of Georgia was the contestation between the British settlements, which were agricultural settlements, and the Spanish settlements, which were like gold and mineral and religious type settlements. So the the archaic uh, expansion of the Spanish, they were not uh, they were not colonialists in the sense that the British were. The British wanted to settle farmers and people and populate the area and have colonies. The Spanish just wanted to get the resources and, and get the hell on really uh, set up something where they can get the resources. But but the point is that because the enslaved people escaping the bondage of South Carolina, went through the contested area of Florida and settled in in and around Fort Mose. Now, we know that Fort Mose is documented because of the you know the Catholic Church and everybody documented the marriages and documented the census and all that kind of stuff. But there were some other areas that we don't even know anything about. Mm-hmm. There's evidence to show that there were colonies, not colonies, there were settlements of native people and and uh, uh, African Maroons, pretty much spotted all over from from what is now east of what from Tallahassee all the way down to uh, up and down the uh, St. John's River. St. John, yeah, up and down the St. John, and through those springs in there. These people were, were and the later history shows that they were uh, uh, an integrated group of people. This was pre Osceola and three uh, bull legs and all those, but those people were there. Now, when the Spanish left at prison, of course, for Menendez and the original settlement of the Spanish left and went to Cuba. So they, they, are, they, they were not a part of the, the next stage of, of the struggle in, in Florida. The people who they left there, uh, who had no allegiance to Spain or to Britain or to America or to anybody. They were settled there and they were thriving. So when the Spanish came back, they saw these people uh, and they called them, they had called them renegades before, but they called them uh, Seminoles and they called them uh, Cimarrones. Cimarrones. And yep. they, they were familiar with them from Central America. And so they, they look like a, an indigenous population. So they call them Seminoles through the language. But they, they were an uh, amalgamation of people who were freedom seeking people. And they lived, you know, in the swamps and in the, uh, in the hollows and places like that. And, and that, that's who, and they fought, they fought the British. I mean, they fought the Americans, and it was a serious uh, conflagration down there, and, and, and there was serious killing going on. But these people were moved, or they attempted to move them, and they had to call them something. So they had the native removal uh, laws. So um, Andrew Jackson was the general down there who was responsible for the Indian removal. And so they called these people a native population, they had to make them a native population in order to try to move them to uh, Oklahoma to clear a northern Florida for plantation settlement. Uh, so what happened was some of them, they, they fought and they fought and then the Seminoles are glad that they obviously said that we never lost. We never went, we never, we never did lose a battle with the, with the, with the Americans. But some of them did end up in, in uh, Oklahoma, and some of them fled south into the Everglades. Now, again, the Everglades was not the Everglades that you see today. The Everglades moved as far north as Lake Okeechobee on the northern side and on the western side of Lake Okeechobee. That was all Everglades then. And so the uh, Seminoles of the, of the Everglades that you see today a part of that particular struggle. And the Seminoles that you see in Oklahoma are also a part of that struggle. And the Seminoles that you see uh, in Tallahassee, you know, they call them black people, but they, I mean, you can look at them and, and see that these people are not 
uh, Africans. They're not white people, uh, but they're in in, uh, in Tallahassee, you know. And uh, and their stories. You see, I'm not just saying this, but their grand people are telling telling them that their their ancestors were Seminoles in Florida, and they they they, they recount the history just like the uh, Tuscarora guy. Uh, he he was clear about who he was. And a lot of these people's grand people were clear about who they were. And so it's part of the law in the families. And these are valid uh, uh, primary resources that have been um, ignored by historiographers, you know. The point that Modibo makes about historiography is a big part of this book. I think we mentioned before that, like, uh, the, the book is essentially a call to reframe how we view history itself not just these two specific places but using them as an example to develop yeah, yeah. um you know what you can call critical historiography historiography for those who aren't familiar is the study of how history is written um and so in critical historiography um tends to offer like a kind of a radical critique of how history is written and and uh in Modibo's case, de-emphasizing the role of, uh, you know, nation states and, and charismatic leaders and stuff like that, and, and instead examining the uh, social history of the people themselves and their struggle for, you know, uh, ecological and directly democratic life. And now, now people realize, people are realizing that Instead of having, when you when you when you engage in an issue oriented struggle or a short term, uh, uh, short term social motion, that hierarchical and charismatic leadership always leads you to in a dead end. You know what I mean? But when people start uh, talking about what they're about to do and what they are, they're going to do it and include everybody. The the motion is much more authentic and genuine. And uh, I mean, I've seen it. I've seen people do things on picket lines. When they get on a picket line, I've seen people go all day and all night on picket lines. And then people start finding ways to feed themselves. And I was looking at the um, the uh, struggle over the pipeline. When, when, when they started breaking down into factions and stuff, that was the problem. But as long as they were pretty much united and eating and it was cold out there i mean it was i mean they they, they were in the middle of winter mm -hmm. and uh but they struggled and maintained the point and, and and i think i think even though they think that they lost it uh i, I think that in the long run they made their point and every little struggle like that helps every one think, of them yeah and i think too the the problems with hierarchical leadership are easily projected back into the past mm -hmm. and and that's where the whole issue with historiography comes in whereas like if you look at okay if you go uh, um if you for instance go to the museum the fort mose museum which is uh, just outside of saint augustine and you you know the museum is actually a really cool little museum um but the, their their treatment of uh, the person that we spoke about earlier, uh, uh, Francisco Menendez, it portrays him as kind of like this, this strong, charismatic leader of the Fort Mose community. And, and that portrayal kind of undermines uh, the, the more horizontal, the more democratic organization that was actually at play. And it's kind of like it's, it's very flimsily done because if you actually look at the history, Menendez is gone for a huge part of the the, the years that the Fort Mosaic community was in that area, and he was he, I mean he was a fascinating guy, but he he left um, at one point to become a pirate, um, and uh, which is fascinating for a whole other list of really cool reasons, but the. Um, while he was gone, he was captured and re-enslaved and escaped 
eventually escaped again and made his way back yeah, to San Jose. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think that it might be true yeah. that uh, Menendez was captured, enslaved, and escaped three different times in his life. <laughs> um, but uh, it's either two or three. It might be three. Um, the but uh, in, in any case, fascinating guy. But but is he the commanding leader of Fort Mose? I I think Modi makes a good case that Fort Mose, the people of Fort Mose, were leading themselves, and Menendez was somebody who had a lot of like inroads with maybe the local Spanish government, and like knew how to finesse them a little bit, and was was uh, had skills to offer the community, and that the Spanish wrote him down as being a leader. Yeah. Uh, because that's yeah. how they understood things, mm. but that wasn't really that didn't really reflect what was actually happening. Yeah. And by the way, that museum was uh, the creature of local activism and pressuring of the state government and raising some money to uh, put that museum up there mm-hmm. because uh, some of the local people knew the history. And they wanted yep. to uh, to project it some kind of way because I saw it happening, and I you know I don't have the place, but I you know every time I could get a chance, I put a little money in there because they they were they were diligent. And when it came out, <laughs> it didn't come out like they had in mind, but it came out of the air. And the it's great there, and, and it's def- if anybody's ever in yeah. St. Augustine who's listening to this podcast, yeah. you should absolutely pay a visit to the Fort Mose Museum. It's about um, two miles north of the city on US. I think it's US one eighty one, right? Yeah. They're right currently raising there. funds to uh to build a uh a reconstruction of a of a of the settlement itself. Yeah. Um the original land that the Fort Mosaic community was on is underwater now due to the history of dredging and just uh obviously climate change and then mm-hmm. the region the the Sands and and everything kind of tend to shift a lot over the course of time anyway, um, which is one reason why that area was some sometimes easy for the Spanish to defend because other people didn't know where the sandbars were and stuff like that. But the um, in any case, the original site is underwater. The second Fort Mose site, because it was destroyed by the English at one point and then rebuilt at another point. Um, the second site is there's a archaeological dig happening on a little island just off of the coast, um, or really just off the river, mm-hmm. and uh, but you can't really access it by foot. So the museum is um, further inland, um, and you can kind of look out from the uh, from an overlook at the museum and and uh, see the island where. The archaeological excavation of uh, the second fort is still happening. See, and they got an explanation on the boardwalk. They have the perspective of the English, the perspective of the Spanish, and the perspective of the American. All these states, right? And I, I did. I talked to them. I said, "What is the perspective of the uh, native people in the Maroons? What is where, where are they?" Here? But you can you can access the uh, the museum from. Uh, if you, go, if you come from downtown St. Augustine going north on A1A, you'll be on your right. Yeah, that's right there. Yeah. I'm a runaway slave. Runaway slave. I'm a runaway slave. I'm a runaway slave. I'm a runaway slave, runaway slave. I'm a runaway slave, runaway slave. I'm the one that got free. I escaped from the cage. Coming back when you sleep at your throat with the blade. I'm like Harriet with the 38 and a vertebrate. Ghetto gospel, apostle, knack, turn a face out. RPG to the grave. I'm that spook by the door with the map to the maze. I'm Auntie Asada's getaway driver on a prison break. Spirit of the BLA, liberating banks, the glitch in the matrix. Flip out of my shackles, grab the whip and throw the captain off the slave ship Rebel to enslavement, 
foul of the mile, mile. Coopy tech, bullet cop, cut head, burn out. I'm a runaway slave. 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 I got the blood of Kunta fighting for my freedom. If I had to lose my life, then so be it. So chop off my feet. Chop off my hands, spin the roll up out this bitch if I can Man, I'm sick of being held back, sick of being blackballed Why you think they label me a motherfucking outlaw? Spirit too bright to be locked in a cage I release my rage when I'm rocking the stage Better yet, cocking the gauge, fleeing the plantation I do this for lost souls, ducking them drug cases I'm burning up my papers and making a few changes I'm dropping my slave name and rocking with my aliens Young know the hope, give hope to young strugglers You one of us, runaway slaves, you should come with us no the Pope, give hope to young strugglers You one of us, runaway slaves, you can come with us I'm a runaway slave, runaway slave I'm a runaway slave, runaway slave. 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 About whatever role uh, poor white and indentured whites had within uh, this larger network of resistance, you've you've kind of alluded to this. I'm just curious if you can talk a little more about you know how some whites either were acting in concert with this ongoing resistance or trying to attack it at all. I don't I don't think there were no distinctions made racially in, in these uh, indigenous and uh, these resistance communities. I really don't. Uh, they, they were just people trying to figure out how they gonna live. That's all. And uh, now the Free State of Jones. That's that was uh, during the Civil War. Yeah. And uh, and uh, which shows that even in, even in the conflagration between states, states' powers and, and clashing armies, you know, there's always some people trying to not be a part of that. You know what I mean? They they they're trying to create. A new kind of uh, existence that neither one of these nation states uh, could respond to. I mean, they, 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 for, as far as their needs were concerned, there were white people who didn't fight for the Confederacy. There were white people who didn't fight for the Union. And so I, I think that I saw the movie too, by the way. And uh, I'm thinking, and then that that was in the middle of a swamp too, by the way. If you know, yeah. if you remember, yeah. yeah, it was in the middle of a swamp, and it was isolated. And I've seen, actually, I've seen people, you can see it now, there are people now who really don't want to be a part of the uh, confusion of urban capitalist life. And, uh, and, and that's, that particular instinct and that particular impulse is a part of us all. We just want to get out inside nature and be left alone 
And uh, we didn't have to go to the store. We didn't have to do all these things, you know, including paying taxes. It would be all right with us. There are people who were like that. I mean, and in the 1960s, the counterculture movement was full of those, full of, those, full of that kind of drop out, uh, going, going somewhere and trying to uh, establish a community, you know, in the middle of capitalism, which uh, was overwhelming. So there's that impulse. I mean, really, there is. And if you look at it, um, from the beginning, you can see that same impulse in in in, uh, in the in the periphery of these empires. You can see the impulse down in Mexico in Chiapas. You can see it. Uh, there are people who just don't don't want to be a part of a society that they can't uh, have anything to say about how they're going to live, and that's the main problem with a big alienated, super capitalist, hierarchical nation state like most of us live in. Whether it's Russia or whether it's United States of North America, whether it's France, England, Nigeria, South Africa, or any of them, there's a certain amount of alienation that people feel when they are governed by these kinds of structures. And uh, I'd like to hear what Andrew has to say about it myself, because, uh, they, they, you know, <laughs> I live in Midway, Georgia, and there's some people live behind me way back in the woods. <laughs> they way back in the woods. And they got a little road, they got a little private road, they go, I don't know what they do back there. <laughs> <laughs> but they, they, uh, they come and go, and they wave, and they say hello. You know, uh, one of them uh, came and wanted to more, uh, one little boy wanted to mow my grass, so I let him mow my grass. But you know, it's, people people want to establish an intimate community where they can govern themselves. That's uh, that's a part of being human, and that's a part of the life we live. You know, and the Free State of Jones is an example of it. Especially when there's a great conflict and great war, you know, conflict of nation states and their clashing armies. People don't want nothing to do with that. <laughs> I think, like like you said, Mariba, the Free State of Jones story is is definitely well after the period of time under examination in your book. Yeah. But related to this question of like uh, white people among the Maroons or, or whatever, and, and to your point of the racial distinctions really not yet being made, yeah. Within this period, um, at least among you know the masses of oppressed people, uh, I'm immediately drawn to the example of the Roanoke colony that you oh, yeah. explained so well in the book. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, maybe, maybe if you want to talk a little bit about that. Um, yeah, the Roanoke colony simply melted with the native people when they came back to get them. They couldn't find them because they, they decided that they didn't want to they didn't want to be got. You know what I mean? They, and so it's a mystery. They call it the Lost Colony of Roanoke. In other words, the, the English set up a colony, and then they left. When they came back, they couldn't find the people, but there was no sign of any kind of massacre or any kind of great battle or anything. The people just mysteriously disappeared. <laughs> well, the was, was it the, Sorry, go ahead. It wasn't a mystery to me. Right, yeah. <laughs> it, it wasn't a mystery to me. They just simply uh, melted away, and it was too long, and they began to... There, there, there are all kinds of examples of white people who actually left those colonies and became a part of Native American society. And when they were retrieved, they ran back away and went back to, to where the Natives were. But they yeah. didn't think that's a, that's a, that's a more a, a kind of life they were more used to and more congruent with what they thought a human being should live. And this same region, by the way, uh, in Roanoke, isn't that also the site where uh, Sir Francis Drake had yeah. dropped off some uh, people of African descent? He dropped off uh, people of African descent who had fought with them in, in Central America, in the Panamanian, what is now Panama. He mm. dropped them off, you know. And so all those people were just mixed, and, you know, mixed race kind of people. And I like to know what Bill Gates, I mean, what uh, Henry Louis Gates think about this. This Henry Louis Gates fella. Yeah, I know Henry. He, he tries. He, he tries to get people to localize the genome based upon the geographical 
uh, geopolitical landscape of the present time. And it's not, you know, you can't find that. I mean, even even if you look at the, the people who live around the Gulf of Mexico, the present Gulf of Mexico, those, those people, uh, thousands of years ago, they were coming and going. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there was they a lot of coming and, yeah. yeah, they were moving. And there are a lot of people who didn't stay, see the idea of people staying in the same place, or you know, all of the people staying in the same place and not seeing them more than about 15, 20 people. Now, these people were adventurous. They left. Some of them left and then came back, brought back other people. It was cultural interaction. Yeah, there's a tremendous amount, actually, in the, tremendous the, amount, of, yeah. of the Gulf of Mexico. Yeah, and it's yeah. really, um, I think we should say that, like, a lot of these histories, um, especially these more horizontal, directly democratic uh, histories, are really only just now being archaeologically investigated. And when I say just now, like we're talking about within the last couple of years, mm -hmm. there has been an explosion of the use of, um, of LIDAR, which is like laser radar, um, to, to map and image all sorts of new archaeological sites. And in these new sites that they're finding, um, and I mean, I'm talking about all over the region of uh, the southeastern United States and Central America. Um, there's something like, within the last couple of years, like 500 new uh, archaeological sites established based on LIDAR. And, and in a really interesting number of those, uh, archaeologists are finding that they see, this is a direct quote from like multiple different archaeologists, no sign of hierarchical organization. No, 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 no. And and if it's and you'll see if you Google it, even just Google it, um, and of course, you know, from there you go JSTOR or whatever, you'll see it again and again and again. Um on in findings in uh places like Mexico, Guatemala, and in uh Georgia and Florida. Yeah. Um and and it's a really it's a really important part of the human story in this region. And it connects really well with Modibo's research because part of what Modibo illustrates is that there were these indigenous forms of intimate direct democracy threading throughout North America and throughout West Africa that were kind of brought to it converged uh, in the in the wake of the uh, uh, horrific transatlantic slave trade, and they converged in the insights like. The Great Dismal Swamp, and like Fort Jose, and um, and, and they converted on the plantations of uh, South yeah. Carolina, and then they run away and form their own inland societies and come back and get their people. You know? Yeah, yeah. These, I mean, these Fort Jose Great Dismal Swamp are just two examples of this of, of this wave of directly democratic social organization and resistance uh, to capitalism. I mean, I mean, these are they're just there are examples that are they're chosen because they're fascinating, but they're I mean it's as as time passes, we're going to see more and more and more examples being unearthed um, because it's I mean it's it's the direction that uh, archaeology in this region is headed. And uh, and then Cahokia now Cahokia was highly highly. Um gratified and uh, it, it had, it had uh, people running away from that. Yes. And, yeah. and they were, they were, the creeks were running away. The people were running away going north and south and east and west. They were going every which way. And then if, if you read Walter, Walter Rodney, you see that the, uh, the Great Western Kingdoms of Western Africa. Yes. The, the way the people were going and leaving those places. Yep. You know, and so uh, it, it, it really... It, it really is a phenomenon to behold because if these big places were so great, why didn't people come come there? They had to be <laughs> all tied and up there and chained. Yeah, I mean, and until recently, you you when you would go to a museum or you read a book um, on the history of these areas, the image that you get when you hear about you know great empires or something like or or these um, these these uh, fabulous kingdoms. Was that this is where you would want to live if you lived back yeah, then, yeah, yeah. right? But it wasn't really the case. <laughs> like like pe people, they they you know they fucked around with it for a little while, but then they, they were like <laughs> yeah, they were like I gotta get back get the hell out of here. This isn't working. <laughs> uh, you see that in modern society. You, I used to see that 
at a four thirty at the factory gate. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh -huh. There you go. <laughs> Everybody, get up. As soon as, soon as they say, let's go, they, they jump out the ram to the car the parking lot. <laughs> That's a phenomenon to see, man. You can get trampled if you don't watch it. <laughs> also, to your point, I mean, you know, just the, the image, I think, popularly that, that history uh, kind of puts forward is that you know, resistance was not the norm. It was something that happened, you know, either through, no. like you were saying, like great leaders or, or just kind of like popped up and bubbled up once in a while. But I think like, you know, the kind of the picture that you all paint is, is that this is a constant stream of resistance and there's just like constantly people fighting back in different ways. And that in reality, like, you know, things like you're talking about with the Great Dismal Swamp, there was actually you know, these very large scale autonomous zones that were being created that mm -hmm. by and large are just completely forgotten by history or, and I would say deliberately so. I think so. I would agree with you that they're not just forgotten. They just, they don't want you to, see, they don't want to show you that part of it because, uh, uh, you know, and they don't want to show you the barbarity. And, and sometimes just the barbarity alone on these uh, imprisonment farms Mm -hmm. Imprisonment agricultural farm, the imprisonment agricultural farm, especially the backer ones. But it, it shows that really that was the dismal place, but it, it doesn't it doesn't show people actively resisting. It's just people just passively taking it, you know. And uh, but that's not the case. I mean people uh -huh. are, and, and, and those moments of, of great unified struggle. Those are the moments in history that, that these new type institutions and a new type of vision of, of, of human society takes place. And those are the way that, but, but the uh, non critical historians look at that as this was, this was when this, the, the society was becoming un destabilized. <laughs> yeah, you're right, right. That's the word you see. That's the word you always see. But, and you know, and you know, um, to your point, the uh, one way when we're talking about resistance, especially. When we look back at this period of history, before you had nation states with, you know, hard borders, right? One of the uh, key methods of resistance was just to fucking leave. They just yeah, go. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and people, you know, if they had a critical mass of, of folks, they could just up and go and start over somewhere else. Yeah. Um, there was There was not really a at least in a lot of cases, there was not really a political barrier to them doing that. Um, absent standing armies and, and police forces and, and uh, wage, you know, waged work, which keeps you in, in, the, in a single place, you know. Um, so it's also the story of resistance in this period is also a story of migration. And that was a, a very similar dynamic happening prior to uh, the transatlantic slave trade. Uh, that dynamic was happening in both North America and in Africa. Um, and in, in both of these waves of migrations, as Modibo points out in the book, are moving towards their respective coasts. So yeah, in Africa, yeah. people are moving away from the uh, central western Sudan. Yeah, and they're moving into moving towards the uh, western coast of Africa. And in North America, they're moving towards the eastern coast, away from places like Cahokia. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was. It, 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 it's, it's, it's occurring almost simultaneously in two different uh, geopolitical regions of the world. And you can that, still see the impact on uh, on the geography. You know, like throughout the southeast, we have oh, yeah. thousands of, of mound-like, you know, mound structures or the remnants of mound structures, which were, uh, you know, are popularly associated with uh, the archaeology of Cahokia. There's little Cahokias. Um, oh, no. Literally no. more egalitarian Cahokia is all around the area, and, and and in the book we include a map yeah. from yeah. circa 1900, where somebody had gone and, and tried to put a dot on every mound site. So not individual mounds, but mound site like a collection of mounds where there would have been a town at some point in history mm -hmm. in the uh, southeastern U.S. And the the thing, every river is just covered with dots mm -hmm. all up and down it. I mean, with thousands and thousands of mound sites that were still visible in 1900. Obviously, the vast majority of those have since, and even at that time, uh, yeah. fallen under you know somebody's private property, and yeah. they've probably been destroyed. 
but you know, a precious few of them have been preserved and, and they're important to see. Here in Georgia, um, you can go to the Akmoki mound site in Macon and they actually have the interior of one of the mounds that they call the Earth Lodge. Oh, yeah. uh, with the original floor is still intact and you can actually see the seats where everybody would sit in this very like it's very clearly a meeting room or, or a council it's room a circle. Or some it's a circle it's yeah. a big circle and, and everybody's got a seat there's no nobody's no elevated or no sitting throne, there. No there's no throne <laughs> and there's, there's a little there's a little stage um at one point in the room and that's the point where at a certain time of day the light would come through the entrance and it would kind of land right there um and sometimes and that's the want to characterize that as that being some kind of throne space or something, but I think that's really up to debate, especially because one time when I was there recently, I was speaking with a um, park ranger who shared with me that during the initial excavation of that site many, many years ago, they actually found a nine others just like it in the immediate vicinity. So yeah, railroad, railroad, central Georgia railroad track goes right through there. Right, they oh, were destroyed by the railroad track. Yeah. Uh, but 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 if but when you consider those other sites, what hap what what you see is not what I mean. This room, the Earth Lodge, is almost portrayed as kind of a ruling chamber. Yeah. But once you consider that there's several other identical ones right within the immediate vicinity, what what some historians characterize as kind of a ruling council chamber actually starts to look a lot more like a neighborhood assembly. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah, yeah. and, and the, this is the kind of critical historiography, critical archaeological work that's we're going to see, like I said, more and more and more of it. And, and so when Modibo says that his book is right on time, I really think that uh, that's an accurate statement. It, it's 100% true because what he's looking at in that book are a new set of ideas, a new set of assumptions about history that um, are going to be informative as people continue to do this work. You're listening to It's Going Down, part of the Channel Zero Anarchist Podcast Network. Follow us online at itsgoingdown.org and on Twitter at IGD underscore news. If you like and appreciate this podcast, go to itsgoingdown.org slash shop and give us a one-time donation. Sign up to donate monthly or donate through Bitcoin. Again, that's itsgoingdown.org slash shop to support. And now, back to the show. The book describes various arms conflicts between uh, these maroon societies defending themselves against colonial forces. Uh, Let's talk a little bit about that. I mean... How successful were they in defending themselves? I've seen a couple uh, documentaries on YouTube where they talk about there were like various fortifications that people built yeah, in the Great yeah. Dismal Swamp. Land was being taken, and they were trying to preserve their way of life. So many of them had to uh, resort to just running away. And uh, in the book, I named some of the several forts in the uh, in the uh, war. The first, the first just war and the second just go war. And they had fortifications, and what would happen was that the plantation owners or the people who uh, ran the government of Georgia, um, government of, of South Carolina and and Virginia, not so much North Carolina, they would uh, send militia uh, up there to take slaves and uh, kill people. And so they had military tactics and stuff. As a matter of fact, in the, in the, what, what I say is the Tuscarora Wars had two different phases, and then the Tuscarora War became the Yamasee War. The Yamasee fought with the colonists at first. And uh, then they set up, so I'm trying to find the name of the force in the area. In North Carolina, but they they surrounded these people's forts and burned it down. But they they, they struggled, and then a lot of them, and they were, they were switching alliances too. Like the Yamasee, who fought with the colonists from South Carolina when they were fighting in the Tuscarora War, when they came home, they they were united with themselves and some other tribes, along with the 
uh, the 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 maroons, including uh, our friend uh, Francisco Menendez, which I don't know his name at that time. He wasn't Spanish. <laughs> yeah, he wasn't Spanish. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but but uh, they formed the uh, militia. You know, the, the black militia. The, see, that's another point that I made. The black militia came out of the Yamasee War. They were already formed. Mm-hmm. The other books say that the, the Spanish formed the black militia and they were sent back up to Georgia to raid the plantations. But they was fighting all up and down there for, for the better part of 60, 70 years. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and for generations and generations of people. And they had guns, and they had people who, who uh, they traded with. And there's a friend of mine who's doing some research on the uh, English English and the Spanish trading posts up and down the uh, St. John mm-hmm. River. And he's trying to show some uh, factors in, in that. But the point is, these people resisted. They won some, they lost some. They helped defend the Spanish, because St. Uh, Saint, uh, Saint Augustine, their, their forts were burned. They faded back into the woods and they recreated, you know, over years and years and years. It was more like a, a guerrilla war and they had forts and they fought. And uh, many of them were bought off and fought against their own people. That's a part of That was a part of it too. But, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a hell of a story. You know, I, I, I just hope uh, when Hollywood gets, gets it, no, shit, don't fuck it up. <laughs> 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 they might just, they might just fuck it up a little bit. Yeah, man. Yeah. <laughs> they'll, they'll make Francis Menendez. He'll be right. There'll, there'll be a Menendez movie at some point. I yeah. guarantee it. Like, that's just. And he'll be riding a big white horse. And he'll be like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know. And that's what Will Smith doesn't play him. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh wow. But that's the, that's the story. You just got to read the book and page by page and see it on the phone. You know? Yeah, yeah. It's it's definitely, I mean, when we talk about armed resistance, the, the Tuscarora and Yamasee Wars are, are, are well discussed and in, in depth in the book. Um, it's a huge part of, uh, of the story um, because it connects, like I said, um, uh, the, the greatest one swamp with Fort Mose. Um, so it's, it's impossible to tell those stories without talking about those wars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. Well, that actually brings us... And the founding of Savannah and that kind of stuff. And there's a town, there's a town in uh, South Carolina named Yamasee. And it's right there, right there on the railroad track going from north to south. And you go through Yamasee on the way to Miami on the uh, Amtrak. Mm-hmm. And you pass by to see Yamasee. And the people, they're getting on and off the train. <laughs> like, a lot of them don't know what happened there, but they, uh, it's Yamasee. And, uh, yeah. and it's important, too, like, when, because, I mean, obviously, anybody who appreciates this book, you know, we encourage them to read more about these histories because it's, it's a short book and, and there's a lot more to tell. But when you're reading about, you know, these conflicts and, and, and uh, these wars, it's important to read with a really critical eye because, you know, if you, if you just do like a quick Wikipedia thing, you might assume that like, you know, you, or you, you, you might not know that there were African people present in the Yamasee War or the Tuscarora War. And, uh, and to, to miss that is to miss a huge aspect of of what those conflicts were and if you read the just read the markers that up and down u.s 17 and stuff mm-hmm. they would always they wouldn't say african freedmen or anything like that they'll say contraband contraband right yeah they call it, call it so you just got to know what that means and then I, I find great joy in uh going to a site yeah it's imagining what these people were going through and and then see uh, 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 like a, mm-hmm. a, a gate or a, a, a river a, a river bank that's been uh, reformed by human labor and seeing how they developed and dug their trunk canals which, did, which required an enormous amount of labor. I remember one time I took a class of mine to the, the Count Swamp 
we were coming up plantation back there. Mm-hmm. And this young man was saying, man, how did they get this to do that, man? They must have, must have had some nice, must have had some tractors or something. Or some, you know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. No, but it, it, I mean, it, it's a monument to human labor. It really is. See that kind of label over there. It's, uh, it's it's overwhelming and it's it's chilling really to stand on on a site like that. Yeah, it is. It is. Well, let's turn towards Fort Mose. We've brought it up a couple times in the conversation. This is another big section of the book. I feel like a lot of people listening to this podcast may have vaguely heard about the Great Dismal Swamp, but probably uh, Fort Mose may be something they've never heard of. So let's just talk about that and why is it important to the book and our wider conversation. Well, Fort Mose was uh, a Spanish response to a problem of uh, people running away from the uh, from the rice plantations of South Carolina, and the uh, direct result of the uh, displacement during the Yamasee War, where large amounts of blacks and native people and uh, even white people were fighting the colon the plantation systems of South Carolina which were uh, which were around in and well around Charleston and they were the ones who were getting some of the early surpluses the labor the surpluses uh, to to Europe in the form of uh, rice shipments and so what they did is they they specifically tried to find black Africans who could grow mm. could grow rice. They were they were the engineers of the time, and so they uh, and and they could uh, uh, control the flow of water, fresh water, so that they could grow these this rice. Now these people in, in Africa were growing the rice for their consumption and for some markets too, but mostly for their consumption. But when they came, when they were brought to the uh, Charleston, South Carolina, they were doing rice for a big market. And so they weren't, they weren't doing it for themselves. They were doing it for uh, the capitalists of the time. And so there were uh, upheavals. You know, there was the slave rebellions in Charleston and outside on the plantation. The system was highly unstable. Mm-hmm. And many of the people left and started going south into the uh, Spanish territories. Mm-hmm. So the Spanish had to come up with some way to accommodate these people. They were refugees, you know what I mean? They, they were looking for some, and so they came up with a way that they could keep them, they could use them, because the militia was very, very uh, 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 effective in fighting. They used them to protect the main town of uh, St. Augustine, and they would have, they would, that's why the, the, uh, the sites were north of St. Augustine, blocking the entrance to the to the right. town to St. Augustine. Right. And so that's where Fort Mose came from, and it was self-governing in the first generation in particular. And then this became the conduit. So people, it was a steady stream of people coming to uh, Fort, really coming to North Florida. Many of them didn't even come to uh, St. Augustine, but it was recorded with the Catholic Church in their documentation that uh, Fort Mose was a real uh, self-governing community north of north of uh, uh, St. Augustine uh, during that time. And we're talking about uh, 12, uh, uh, 17, 17, uh, 14 to 1740, right in there. Mm-hmm. Large numbers of people were coming south. It was an underground railroad, really, but... Right, yeah. 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 And that's, that's the thing that I think a lot of folks who aren't familiar with the history of Fort Mose might not realize that the Underground Railroad uh, ran south before it ever ran north. Um, And, uh, and that was, you know, Fort Mose was, was, it was something that people knew about people who were enslaved in uh, South Carolina knew about it. It's Fort Mose was, uh, you know, could easily have be said to have inspired the Stono Rebellion. That's where these people were headed. Yeah. And, um, so it, it, Fort Mose was, like I said before, was really different from the Dismal Swamp at the time um, because it was well known. Like the people knew that there were these African fighters who had a had their own town north of St. Augustine, and um, and it, it when when you talk about thorn in the side of uh, settler colonialism, 
uh, from the British point of view, this was a it was a hell of a thorn. Yeah, yeah. And they and they attacked it in. Uh, uh, That's why they created Georgia, really. It is, yeah. Georgia yeah. Was in the buffer of the sea. Okay. Yeah, yeah. There was this thing called the Georgia experiment. Yeah. Which was Georgia was originally intended as a, a to be a state without slavery, not because before or anybody else was some kind of enlightened individual, but because they didn't want any black people there, so that they would know if anybody was trying to escape uh, south to Florida. Um, and then they they populated it with uh, mostly convict labor, um, who ended up uh, complaining so much that the uh, um, colonial authorities eventually uh, um, allowed them to start buying people just like the other colonies. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, but, but, but the thing, the thing that's really, really important to know mm-hmm. is that these these enslaved people did make the Spanish create yes. something like that. You know yeah. what I mean? And it wasn't it wasn't uh, wasn't the Spanish's idea. You right. Know, it was it was the creation of their own initiative. You know. Enslaved people's initiative, and that was not the other thing to know is that that was not the only one, but that was the most well documented of those. Yeah, yeah, they were, they were all over. They was all they were peppering that whole region there. And I think to to your point, Modibo, about the um, the self self governing origins of Fort Mose is that um, today, popularly, the name Fort Mose. This is something we talk about in the book. Um, but that was actually a surprise for both of us to learn. Um, we, we didn't actually, none of us really knew this before we started doing the research on this book. But the uh, the name Fort Mose, that's how oh, yeah. we pronounce it now. And that's how books literally tell you to pronounce it. Like if you look at any of the major uh, studies of Fort Mose, left parentheses and it'll suggest a pronunciation, Mo Se, um, is actually. That's likely a mispronunciation. Um, in, in fact, the older maps from that period, most of them label the fort as Fort Musa. Uh, as we in have the, a map in the book, too. We, and we have one of those maps produced in the book, yeah. Um, and, and Musa is, you know, the Arabic name for Moses. Um, Arabic being a language that would have been spoken by many of the Africans who were present at, at Fort Musa. And... Um, who were Muslim, yeah. and uh, so it's it shows that these folks settled this town, built it, and named it, and that name actually ended up getting reflected in the Spanish colonial record, yeah. um, if mispronounced or, or misspelled. Um, you, can, you 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 can actually go to Saint Augustine today and see some buildings with. Uh, you know, minarets like uh, like the uh, sp- like the Muslims uh, call to prayer from those minarets. There's some there's some towers like that, and 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 the architecture of uh, of Saint Augustine today, and you can see it. I mean, that that's the skill that, you, that we all have to develop. When we go to a place, we don't see what we see. Mm. We see mm-hmm. what it was and what it can be. That, mm. That's that's that, that's that's what makes it exciting. Yeah. And the, the other thing we, we wanted, uh, uh, St. Augustine was a Spanish outpost. Mm-hmm. The Spanish had just been controlled by a Muslim uh, invasion in Spain in the Iberian Peninsula for mm-hmm. almost uh, four, five hundred years. Mm-hmm. And so the Spanish during that time were really dark skinned mulatto looking people. And so really uh, uh Saint Augustine was regarded as a uh, as a uh, I've heard it referred to and I, I don't disagree with it, but I heard it referred to as a uh, a town of mixed mixed racial art. there's no whites and blacks. It was just people all mixed up, you know what I mean? Yeah. And then there's uh, people refer to it as a Creole town, a Creole society. And even the Spanish boats, the Spanish uh, ships, that they kind of uh, that look to them, that uh, some people call it that uh, that ready look, that ready, you know, uh, brownish mm-hmm. colored look. Because uh, um, I mean, the racial thing was gradually being defined and written into the codified law right. of the United exactly. States of North America over time. Right. 
But I mean, there was no separate bathrooms in St. Augustine until until after the Americans occupied. Right, and and like, and and it really shows that like how not only in what became the United well in what became the United States, but not only in the English colonies, but you know the English colonies and the Spanish colonies, like Modelo says, had a very different conceptions of you know what became known as race, and um, and they had very different laws that were governing uh, the the status of uh, of different individuals from different backgrounds. And uh, in in the Spanish colonies and in St. Augustine, you know, these laws were much more complex. And uh, in the British colonies, uh, they were like, if you're in any way related to somebody from Africa, we're going to enslave you, was kind of the, the British approach. The Spanish approach was, uh, you know, it was being a more of a creolized society. It, it, they it didn't really do things that way. From what I remember in history, um, the Spanish had like just immense like categorizations of race, like mulatto. Right, that's what that's what I'm talking about. So, like when you had those, but those categorizations are they emerge over time. Yeah, they do. They do. And um, and so the, the period of time that we're talking about is when some of that stuff is still being worked out. Yeah. And you had you know and and the the effects of that process of of uh, that racialization are happening in real time for the people who were living in Fort Mose. And, um, I mean, for example, you'll have, you know, one governor who they're able to kind of sway to, uh, to patronize them. Then you have another governor, like, so like, for example, um, after the British attack Fort Mose and, and, uh, and destroy it, they, I mean, they were trying to attack St. Augustine, but the Fort Mose militia basically fought them off, but they lost their homes in the process. Yeah. They then moved into St. Augustine for 10 years, where they lived as, as far as we can tell, equal members of uh, the community. Yeah, until they, married, a, they intermarried. And, 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 yeah. yeah. Until a new governor came to power who was, I mean, who was kind of vocally racist and wanted the, and wanted the Fort Mose people to be removed from the uh from the fort, from St. Augustine, and he he ordered them to go build a new fort and live in it. See, the English thought that black people were and and native people were an inferior race of people, and they could not be saved no kind of way. Right. Spanish believe that these people, if you give them religious training and they accept Catholicism, then they can become protective citizens. In other words, they were not. They were not dehuman, you know. As a matter of fact, the non- a lot of the people had the people. Some of the Spanish people married other people's slaves and freed them. They had a, a complicated kind of situation there. Yeah. Well, but but it it, it uh, it's it's um it worked itself out just like Andrew said in real time. Mm-hmm. And, and 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 these various governors who were appointed from they were not elected, of course, they were appointed. And so they, they reflect what was going on in Spain, right? And, and so and so it was a shift in state policy back and forth, kind of like the Republican and the Democratic Party are now. You know, you just <laughs> Democrats are in power. You know, you have more welfare state. If the Republicans are in power, you have more police. You know. But but then, but in the meantime, Menendez is actually petition for his freedom and the freedom of the, the original settlement. Settlers of Fort Mose, and they became they became uh, equal. Well, they became freedmen. Right. Oh, not if they became equal. They became freedmen. Mm-hmm. And in the second Mose, many of the many of the people, it was a mili- more of a military garrison then. But they had they had wives who were slaves, or who were free people who lived in um, in the adjacent Native American vi- villages, or some of the other villages, or even in, in Saint Augustine itself. In the book, you talk about how you all created the Autonomous Research Institute for Direct Democracy and Social Ecology, yeah. which is an amazing name for a project. But it's carried out expeditions to study the history of the Great Dismal Swamp and beyond. Just tell us a little bit about that. Well, it's a collection of independent scholars who uh, are uh, independent researchers who are uh, working on uh, a rewriting of this history that we're talking about. Like Andrew and myself, we uh, uh, we call ourselves conveners, and we were in the process of convening, you know, uh, these scholars when the pandemic hit. 
So we're going to have to redo the page and reconvene these scholars. But we've identified several several scholars that we want to bring together and help facilitate their projects through discussion and through uh, the support of the press on our own authority press to get get some people to get that work out. So that it'll, it'll, it'll be a part of the of the debate, the public debate on, on the history. Uh, so we've been we've been working on that and uh we 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 have we have, we've identified some some people who are doing good work. And when you do good work and everything, we sit down and we say, Well, okay, you can be a convener now. They <laughs> can <laughs> <laughs> come in and we we we'll sit down and uh we we got a couple of people that we're gonna bring in. Plus we had one one of our original conveners passed on. Yeah. So so we have to uh, honor him and acknowledge him. And so, you know, it's a, it's a work in progress, let's put it that way. But we wanted to, to just to, to label it something so you would not, you would not have no mistake about it. An Autonomous Research Institute for Direct Democracy and Social Ecology. It's not the uh, CLR James Institute. It's not the Walter Rodney Institute. <laughs> we wanted to name it for what it is so it would be less confusion about it. And so these projects are part of it. I mean, our, our work here is a part of that uh, hopefully growing body of literature which uh, uh, could impact the discussion and the direction of activism and further research, really. Looking back on all the work that you've done, what does this history tell us about the strengths and the weaknesses of settler colonial capitalist regimes? If we're t- talking about the looking at the historical stability of, of settler colonial governments, when we're looking at, in history, as Modibo mentioned earlier, these societies were like very unstable. And what, but what that says about settler colonialism now in the 21st century, I'm not sure. Uh, I think it's an, I think it's an open question. Um, I mean, we're dealing with things have gotten to the point or we're dealing with militaries that can destroy the world two or three times over. Um, with the push of a button, when we're talking about armed resistance to such militaries domestically, it, it raises some real serious concerns. That being said, I think Modibo and I all, often talk about the um, ecological dimension being a very, very important aspect of resistance because these states can destroy the world two or three times over. We have to, on some level, organize around the basis of like, holy shit, that's really fucked up, and we 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 can't have, we just can't have that. Yeah, so I think that that's the social ecology angle. I mean, and then of course you can talk about, uh, cap. I mean, capitalism is always wildly unstable. Like, I mean, it's just, I mean, we're living through it right now. <laughs> uh, I mean, you you see the 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 prices of you know so-called energy and the, and the price of food and, and everything's going to hell and they got wars on and it's a it's a rough time uh, to, to be on uh, planet earth right now no matter who you are human or, or non-human yeah I mean so th- I mean clearly the economic system is unstable and clearly I mean the crisis in uh, I shouldn't say crisis but the, the war in uh, Ukraine shows that the, the nation state system is not stable because I mean it's, it's a complete complete breakdown i mean you have when this happened the immediate fear and everybody's mom's like oh my god world war three and now everybody's got nukes and i mean it was it was panic and uh and i think rightly so and i think that it it shows how unstable things are now does that instability mean that it's vulnerable to direct action in the same way that it might have been in centuries past i don't know but uh, I think I think it's I think that's beyond my ability to speculate on. Well, well what, what, what you said earlier, though, when you said it, that, that resistance is constant. Mm-hmm. Well, it's constant, but it's dynamic. It is dynamic. Uh, and, but the nation states are the ones that are keeping people from one another, yeah. keeping people from being human keeping people from working together and causing people to kill one another in mass. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure that the uh, the Russian people who live in Moscow don't want to hurt nobody who live, live in Kiev. I mean, they, 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 but the nation states policy 
including Polish nations. Their policies make them fight with one another. Right. But 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 the thing, the thing that I, I wanted to really really say about nation state, not just the colonial settler col colonial nation states like South Africa and Australia and all of these, uh, you know, in, including Canada. But most of these nation states are the result of migration and movement of clans and uh, people from other places who were created hierarchy, which they can, uh, are, is, is unstable. And they're the yeah. ones who are destroying the planet. I mean, they, 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 the planet is up for grabs to make money. I mean, how much toilet tissue do we need? You know what I mean? And, and how many trees must we uh, knock down to make how many uh, pieces of paper? You know what I mean? So the thing that we need to do right now is to become skilled at observing popular motion and the democratic tendency within it. And you can see it sometimes and unite with it and work with it and push it. Like, for instance, that struggle with in Atlanta with that... Uh, that Kale was involved in with the uh, police academy being built in the uh, in the, one of the last areas of natural uh, uh, natural growth in, in, in yeah, the area. South Forest, yeah. Uh, yeah, South Forest. Yeah. That was a very significant struggle. What's still going on? I don't know. But yeah, so I'm glad. I'm glad. And so the, the struggle is going to go on. People are going to resist. But then there are people who are going to be trying to minimize the importance of the resistance or subvert the resistance. They won't be individual people like from these old leftist parties in these uh, black petty bourgeois organizations. They're coming in and want to have a president and a vice president and a secretary and a treasurer. And they want to raise some money and then they start fighting over the money and all that kind of stuff. We have to counteract that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but but they're going to be struggles in places that you don't even know, and they're going to take forms because of the great uh, diversity of the possibility of a, a social struggle and the vulnerability of capitalism and all these different points. We just have to be astute enough to see when the masses move and see what they try to do and try to help them out and, and, and show them that, that uh, if you do it this way, you will fail. You start electing uh, Mr. John Jackson, Deacon, whatever his name, as the president, and he, he's the only one that can call you together, and he's the only one talking in the meeting, that's going to fail. But if you sit down and everybody is engaged and talking, that has a greater possibility of moving us along. Now, this is a long-term struggle now. Mm -hmm. The nation state, the most important uh, array of institutions that define human identity in the world today. When you got a passport, first thing you say, a citizen of the United States. Mm -hmm. And if you're not a citizen of nowhere, you can't hardly move. Mm -hmm. You know, so what we have to do is starting to break that down so that people will understand that a border is not natural. Mm -hmm. You know, and that these natural ecosystems in the Georgia coast, we live downstream of everything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so that's a natural way that you can approach the struggle by uh, preserving these rivers and preserving the cleanliness of these rivers and stopping the pollution and keeping people from owning the private property right there next to the river and let the rivers flow, you know, that kind of stuff. That kind of stuff to people. And then make sure that the, that the uh, police don't be cutting down the trees in the name of trying to protect your neighborhood by <laughs> cutting down the trees, you know? Mm -hmm. So all of that kind of stuff, you just have to figure it out and be creative. Well, you know, because the masses, they moving all the time. And then some, sometimes you just got to be clearer on what they're what they fixing to do. And sometimes it's going to be real bad defeats. Like I was at a city council meeting uh, just last night. And I was just trying to get term limits on the on the elected officials, and and I couldn't get that past nobody. Damn man! <laughs> but then they, they already stacked the meeting with council people and the mayor and all the people that was uh, seeing that as an orderly process. 
Do you want to talk about how people can get the book, follow your work, and any other oh, thing shit, you yeah. want to say? The book is available uh, from the publisher's website. That's O O O A Books. O O Books. O O O A Books dot org. Um, you can also follow us on Instagram and uh, Facebook and Twitter, all that shit at O O O A Books. Uh, well, books stands for On Our Own Authority. Well, Debo and I are both on Facebook. I have a Twitter, uh, uh, at Andrew Zonneveld. We're, we're out there. This has been the It's Going Down podcast. Check itsgoingdown.org for daily updates, columns, action reports, and news. Go to itsgoingdown.org slash shop to support us. And follow us on all social media platforms. IGD, your daily resource for insurgent proletarian life.